they're dispositive, and this is one of the uh, the best uh, Ubicon best uh, uh, paper uh, winner. So again, it's pretty. All right, uh, thanks a lot. So again, my name is Gabe Cohn from the University of Washington, and I'm going to present a new kind of ultra low power human body motion sensor, which uses a new technique called static electric field sensing. So as I said this morning in madness, you know, sensing human body motion is something the Ubicon community is very familiar with. We've been doing this for activity recognition, health and wellness applications, and elder care for a long time. Um, and we typically do this using accelerometers. In fact, accelerometers are becoming so popular, they're put into all of our mobile devices, like our phones and our tablets. And because they're so popular in these mobile devices, the power consumption um, of accelerometers has been highly optimized. So the best, uh, lowest power commercial accelerometers you can get today are around 400 to 1,000 microwatts, which is very low power. If you look at the research community, it's even better. Around 36 microwatts is the best accelerometer you can get coming out of research. And I'm going to present a new technique which gives similar, although not the same kind of data as an accelerometer at only 3.3 microwatts. So you probably can't even see that line on the graph there. So I'm going to switch to a log scale. Um, and what you see is this new static electric field sensing device is two orders of magnitude lower power than the best commercial accelerometer today. In addition, it gives information an accelerometer can't give. That is, if you wanted to use accelerometers to measure the motion of all the limbs of a runner as they're running, you'd have to instrument each limb individually. And that's a bit cumbersome. Um, but with the static electric field sensor, you can actually measure motion of all parts of the body, even though they're not, the sensor itself isn't on that. So at this point, you probably don't believe me. It sounds a little too good to be true. So let me show you uh, a demo. All right, so what you can see here is the top line, I'm actually wearing on my wrist here, this sensor. Uh, the top line, the red line, is the output of our static electric field sensor. And the lower three lines are the three axes of an accelerometer I put on there, just for comparison. So if I don't move my arm, as you expect, all the lines are flat. If I wave my arm, you can kind of see that, there we go. Um, you know, the static electric field sensor sees the signal, and so does the accelerometer. But what's more interesting is if I hold my arm steady and move my leg, and I step over here, and you can see that as I move my leg, um, the signal's a little bit weak up here, but you can kind of see the static electric field sensor can see this movement, and the accelerometer obviously can't. All right, so let me explain how this works. All right. So uh, essentially, I, I've been saying static electric field sensing. So let me explain traditional electric field sensing. And hopefully that little pop-up will go away. There we go. Um, so this is nothing new. In fact, this is nothing new even to the HCI community. Back in 95 was the first Kai paper that mentioned electric field sensing. And the way these traditional approaches work is there's a transmitter and a receiver. The transmitter produces a time-varying electric field, and the receiver receives the strength of that field somewhere else. And the presence or absence of the human body will modulate the amount of field strength seen by the receiver. Um, and this is, there's been a lot of active work in electric field sensing and capacitive sensing since 95. In fact, just this last year at CHI, uh, one of the best paper awards was a paper called Touche, which extended this work from 95 and actually did, did a, a frequency sweep instead of just looking at a single frequency. But all of this work actively produces time-varying E-fields and then senses the fields they produce. In contrast, we're going to rely on static or DC fields that are already present and simply measure what's there. So let me show you how this works. So here we have the human body and the environment, and I'm showing in red the field lines. So when the field lines are closer, they're stronger, there's a stronger E field or stronger capacitive coupling. In this case, you can see there's stronger coupling between the body and the environment, which I'm going to call ground, uh, at the feet rather than the rest of the body. So let me add my wrist-worn sensor. So now there's also a field between, there's a ground plane on the sensor, so there's a field between that ground plane and the body, and that ground plane and the environment. And since I'm an electrical engineer, I want to represent this with a simple circuit model, so I'll use three capacitors. So there's the green one, which is the capacitive coupling between the body and the local ground plane on our sensor. There's the coupling between that local ground plane on the sensor and the environment, and then between the body and the environment. And so what we're going to do is we're going to measure the voltage between our two electrodes, which are that local ground plane and the body. And as you can see from this equation, 
The voltage we're going to sense is a function of the charge on either side and the capacitive coupling between the body and the environment and the whole ground plane on the sensor and the environment. So, for example, when I was standing over there waving my leg, as I lifted my leg, my capacitive coupling to ground or to the environment changed significantly. So that's CV in this equation. And when CV changes, that sensed voltage VS changes. And the red line that you were seeing was just that sensed voltage. All right, so what kind of hardware is necessary to, to sense this? Well, it's quite simple, and we implemented it on this wristwatch. The first thing we need is contact to the body, which we do with a conductive strap. Um, we then have this um, sensing front end, which in which case we uh, AC couple the signal, we bias it to mid-rail, uh, we apply some gain because these signals are very small, uh, and we low-pass filter the signal to remove the 60 hertz component and some of the higher frequency components, which are also present on the body, and some of my password, like human antenna, has shown. Um, and also on this watch, we... Oh, so this whole thing, as implemented on this watch, consumes 3.3 microwatts. So this is using off-the-shelf discrete components, which actually have a much higher bandwidth than we need. Um, if we were to make a custom integrated circuit to do just this function, we could probably reduce this by about two to three orders of magnitude. Um, so also on this watch is an S430 microcontroller and a wireless transceiver. And that's basically to capture this data and then send it to my computer so I can show you these squiggly lines. Um, when I talk about the power consumption in the talk and in the paper, I'm not talking about the microcontroller or the transceiver, just the sensing front end. Um, all right, so, well, okay, so we, we made this circuit, right, and I showed you squiggly lines, but the next question is, is that useful, or are these just a bunch of squiggly lines? Um, so we did a user study in which we got six participants to go to two different locations and perform six different actions. So the six different actions they were doing while wearing this watch are resting, uh, typing, mousing, uh, small arm movements, which we made them do by sorting a deck of cards, uh, walking and jogging. And the first thing we wanted to look at is can we, using a simple threshold on our sensed voltage, determine different levels of activity the user is doing. So we're going to take all those actions that I just told you and group them into four different levels of activity. So there's no movement, hand and finger movements, so typing and mousing, uh, arm movements, and then full body movements like walking and jogging. And so Again, we're trying to find if we can just take thresholds of that sense voltage to divide these four classes. So we did an ROC analysis. Um, and what you can see here, if you look at the red curve, that's trying to find a threshold between rest and hand and finger movements that you can't really find a good threshold which separates those two classes. And this makes sense because when you're moving your hands and fingers, your capacitive coupling to the environment doesn't change very much. So essentially, the, the changes in the signal are basically in the noise. Uh, if you look, however, at the blue curve, which is the threshold between whole body movements and smaller movements, it's actually quite easy to set a threshold to see when that, that change happens. So why is it useful to use a simple threshold on the voltage? Well, let's take a look at the hardware you need. So again, this is that sensing front end I showed before. It consumes 3.3 microwatts using the discrete components we used. If we want to do a simple threshold, we just add two comparators. So that's just another 3.3 microwatts. And so that's 6.6 .6 microwatts total, and what that gives us is a signal for wake-up. So imagine you have an application where you have a higher power sensor, like an accelerometer, maybe a GPS, um, some sort of wireless transceiver for location. Um, and as soon as the user stops moving, you want to turn those high power sensors off. But then, how do you know when to turn them back on? So if you run our wake-up circuit at only 6.6 microwatts total, um, you could know as soon as the user starts moving. And you can set your threshold to the kind of movement you want. So maybe you want to wake up when they start moving their arms, maybe you want to wake up you know, when they start walking, but not when they move their arms. And so you can do that, again, in only 6.6 .6 microwatts. So this uh, ultra-low power wake-up application is quite powerful. The next question is, can we do more? Can we do more than just wake up? Can we actually do some of the applications that you can do with an accelerometer? Um, so we treated this as more of a machine learning type problem, and we took four of our different actions, rest, small arm movements, walking, and jogging. And we used a KNN classifier with K equals one, and six different features, four from the time domain, two from the frequency domain. 
we first wanted to look at this as a feasibility study. So if we train a model per user, per location, how well can we do? And we got an accuracy of about 92%. So this is, this is promising. It says, all right, you know, we actually can separate out these different classes of activity simply using this signal that we can capture at 3.3 microwatts. So let's look at a little more realistic scenario. Let's look at if we train on one of the sessions, so our data was collected in these separate sessions which are separated in time. So we train on the first session and then test on the remaining five. So this is a case where you, know, you get this new sensor, you put it on, you train it once, and then you want it to work after that, wherever you go. Um, in this case, we get an accuracy of about 80%. So it's a little bit lower, but this is still quite promising. It shows that, yes, you know, we actually can use this um, for, again, classifying different kinds of actions. All right, so let me give a quick summary and address some of the limitations. So I'm presenting this new kind of sensing called static electric field sensing. Um, it's ultra low power, uh, lower power than an accelerometer, and also gives you the ability to sense parts of the body that aren't themselves instrumented. Um, but with that comes some major limitations. So we're not actually sensing movement. So in the case of an accelerometer, it is truly sensing the acceleration experienced on the device. Um, and as a result, you can actually separate that out into three channels, the three axes. Um, well, all we're really sensing is changes in the capacitive coupling of the body. So this is, as I've shown, because of movement, but it could be because of other changes. So, for example, the environment could change. Someone could run past you, or some object could move closer or farther from you, and we would still see that as a movement and wouldn't be able to separate it out. Um, but I've showed that it is useful for a low-power wake-up, as well as some simple body motion classification. And with that, I'll conclude and open up for questions. Thank you. James Crowley, University of Grenoble, Ontario. Cool, I want one. <laughs> um, uh, I, you, did, you weren't really clear about some of the experiments at the end there. Um, it wasn't clear, first of all, whether you were training uniquely on one individual or across several individuals, whether the training from one person applied to another. More precisely, you weren't clear about whether people change their clothing or their shoes, because the signal it would seem to me would change dramatically when you change your shoes and when you change your clothing. Yeah. So, in all the numbers I showed, that is trained per user, um, and yes, it does look different on different users. And if you change your shoes or your clothes, it does change. Um, the data we collected was for each user on two different days, and we didn't tell them to wear the same shoes or the same clothes. Um, but yes. Uh, I would certainly expect that if they wore drastically different shoes, that we would see different So my follow-up question is, can I use this to detect if somebody, what somebody's wearing? Uh, yes. In fact, we were kind of playing around with this in the lab and realized that Skechers, the shoes, um, basically have very little insulation to ground. And so when you're wearing Skechers and you move around, you don't really see much because you're kind of almost always grounded. Uh, where if you have, you know, big, thick soles, then we see a lot more signal. I don't comment. If you make some copies, I'd like one. Okay. <laughs> hey, great work. Uh, this is really cool. Um, I was just wondering, you were talking about the limitations just now. Um, are you guys looking at how to isolate these external factors that might come into play? Because it seems like that's a, kind of a showstopper, right? I mean, if you're walking by perhaps some big electromagnetic field, which happens all the time, then there's not much you can do unless you come up with some solution. So I was just wondering if you guys had some ideas for things to do to address that. Um, so, I mean, you know, some of them are, you know, true limitations, you know, if we are sensing the passive coupling between yourself and the environment, and that changes, but it's not because you move, you know, what can we do about it? Um, and so that, that makes it a big limitation for kind of replacing the accelerometers I present near the end. And so I don't really see that as kind of the big application of this. It still works really well for low power wake up, because in that case, you can wake up, sample your accelerometer, and see, oh, actually I didn't move, and then immediately go back to sleep. Let's take one more quick question. Jim Park from MIT. One of the limitations I can see is that it actually requires a strap. And do you think do you think it would be possible to incorporate this into a smartphone, for example? Uh, yeah, it, it's certainly possible to put this in other devices. Um, you know, as, as it is right now, it needs contact to the body, but. Um, and it, you know, as long as you're sensing DC, you really do need that contact. But as I've shown, there's some other low frequency components you can get uh, without the true contact. Okay, so that's it. Yeah.